Hi, everybody. I'm Kate Ryder, founder and CEO of Maven. Thank you so much for being here today. So these continue to be unstressful uh, or uncertain and stressful times. Many of us have suffered losses, whether it's the loss of loved ones, of normalcy of jobs, and we still don't have an end date. These losses can trigger grief, uh, but the isolation and inability to support the grieving process can make it even more challenging. Today, we'll be talking about coping with loss and grief from navigating the many emotions that come with loss to strategies for coping with individual and collective grief and checking in on your mental health. If you'd prefer to speak to a provider directly and privately, you can also download Maven Clinic in the App Store and ask a Maven practitioner for free with the code webinar. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jane Vendis, Dr. Brian Levine, and Cynthia Caulfield. Dr. Vendis is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist. She works as an OB hospitalist in California and is Maven's medical director. Dr. Levine is the founding partner and practice director of CCRM New York. He is board certified in both reproductive endocrinology, infer and infertility and obstetrics and gynecology, and is Maven's fertility advisor. Cynthia Caulfield is a clinical social worker based in New York and a practitioner on Maven. Please click on the Q&A at the bottom right of the screen to submit your questions privately, privately and anonymously. We'll try to cover as many as possible in this session. So Dr. Levine, let's start with you. Getting pregnant is often thought to be a natural, spontaneous, and fun process, but for people going through fertility treatments right now, it's a different experience. How can people manage their mindset during this process? Well, first I just wanna say thank you, Kate, for having these weekly webinars. I, I think these have been incredible. Thank you for including me in today's conversation. Um, you know, I think the, the hard part is that for a lot of people, going to the fertility doctor when they look backwards and retrospectively can be a good experience, um, but very few are excited to go initially. And the stress that is experienced around making that first appointment for many people is grappling with loss, um, either the loss of a pregnancy that could have been something, um, the loss of control where people feel like they're not able to get their bodies to do what they feel is such a natural and easy thing to do. Um, or even just the loss uh, of feeling like there's a light at the end of the tunnel because everybody knows either one way or another um, that going through fertility treatments is a process and that process can involve procedures. The, um, the way that people in my experience, um, grapple with infertility is that typically they they want a child or they want to freeze their eggs or, or both, um, but when they want it, they almost want this immediacy with it. And I think one of the hardest things that we're grappling with right now during this COVID-19 pandemic is that we're really socially distancing ourselves as much as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is we're distancing our um, patients that are coming into the office. We're limiting exposure to patients to protect patients and providers. Um, but with that also, we're kind of limiting our opportunities to see a patient, um, even as an OBGYN, where you have that doorknob conversation, right? Just as the doctor's walking out of the exam room, the patient says, oh, by the way, you know, we've been trying for two years. Um, let me know when you get my path back. And so I think during this time right now, it's, it, it's really one where people have to kind of take that look and take that step to say, this is tough. This is not going to be easy, but what can we do um, to get to where we want to go? And Brian, if a patient has already suffered a pregnancy loss, do you have any suggestions on how they can get prepared to try again? Yeah, so, you know, as, as I look at my personal practice and also our group of the four doctors here at CCRM New York, um, I could divide the patient populations out into thirds. The first third would be the people who have trouble getting pregnant, and I think those are kind of like your classic infertility patients, trying for six months or a year or longer, something like that. The other third that everyone always thinks about is the egg freezers, right? or embryo freezers or sperm freezers coming in to protect or preserve their fertility for either personal or medical reasons. But then there's that messy third in the middle 
um, which are the people who have trouble staying pregnant. And one of the hardest things I think about a miscarriage is that it feels like it's something taken away. Um, and so sometimes it's occurring because it is um, a genetic abnormality, which is probably the most common reason people have miscarriages. But other times it can be due to an either environmental or biological or biochemical reasons. So if someone's gotten through a miscarriage, I'd say the first thing to do is to recognize that it is a loss and should be mourned and recognized. Um, but the second thing to do is to try to gather as much information as possible. When do you think you got pregnant? Did the doctor ever think that your dates were off? Did someone think it was measuring small on an ultrasound? Um, do you have any records from those things? And try to be the best um, historian you can, recognizing that many of the data points are not as objective as you think they are, and they are pretty subjective, but try to collect as much data as possible. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, Jane, over to you. How do you cope with the loss of the postpartum and newborn experience that you had planned for? especially with pressures from family members who haven't accepted the loss either and are pressuring you to have visitors and relax social distancing rules so they can meet your baby? Yeah, this is a, this is a really important question. And I think it's one that, um, you know, so many women and families across the country are grappling with. Um, my first piece of advice would be to um, plan on resetting your expectations um, I think a lot of the grief and sadness that, that happens, happens in part because um, it's not the process of the postpartum period is not going uh, in the same way that, that you plan. Um, and obviously, uh, those who had baby showers uh, canceled in the first few weeks of the pandemic, um, you know, might have experienced more loss of that than, than those who maybe were earlier in the pregnancy and they have more time to sort of do that reset of expectations. So having said that, you know, I think a lot of, of having a baby and bringing home a baby is about, um, uh, not to put too fine a point of it, but it, it's about cultural rituals. It's about, um, you know, what you have seen or experienced in previous pregnancies and recreating those experiences in this pregnancy. So it kind of forces us to reimagine um, uh, new rituals and, and what could those look like. Um, obviously some of those rituals could be transferred over into an electronic uh, fashion, which is to say, you know, creating um, gatherings, but you know, maybe some, some people could be in person while others um, maybe due to health or age should be electronic. Um, but try to imagine uh, what new rituals could look like in this in this pandemic. Um, obviously, I think as Cynthia is going to emphasize, um, focus on what you can control. There um, is, is likely, in, in in some situations, some variables that you can control, and so focusing on those instead of what is missing from the picture. And then I can't sort of say enough about. Um, taking the feelings that you that you have and the disappointment and sadness that you have and and moving them externally whether that's through journaling um, even just getting outside and taking a walk luckily um, the weather is, is turning other than last weekend up in the northeast where they had snow um, but journaling maybe art therapy music um, gardening anything that allows you to sort of um, express your grief and sadness outside of yourself. And Jane, another question. Uh, you know, a lot of studies that are coming out around pregnancy and COVID positive patients, you know, are saying that there's an increased risk of miscarriage and particularly in the first trimester. And so how often do you see patients having miscarriages and can you speak to the risks of pregnancy loss during each semester right now? Oh, sure. I, I, I really am glad that we're talking about this topic today because so many women, um, as Brian alluded to, experience um, miscarriage. I think a lot of women, um, when they have a miscarriage, imagine that, that they are alone in that. Having said that, um, nearly uh, 25 to 30 percent of all pregnancies actually end in miscarriage. And, and sometimes those miscarriages even happen before a woman recognizes that she's pregnant. Um, 
one study I looked at showed that 43% of women who actually had already had a baby had experienced at least one miscarriage in their lifetime. So knowing for one that you're, you're definitely not alone um, and knowing that um, for the most part, miscarriages in the first trimester um, are due to chromosomal abnormalities. Um, you know, the embryo doesn't have the right number of chromosomes or they're arranged in um, a way that doesn't allow for the development of an embryo. It's important to know, I think, too, that 50% of women who suffer from a miscarriage have some psychological um, complications in the weeks and months after that loss. So knowing not only is miscarriage um, uh, a commonplace thing for women, but that it's also really common to experience uh, symptoms of, of sadness, depression, anxiety, or even 10% uh, of women have re reported to have symptoms of PTSD following a miscarriage. You know, when we talk about miscarriage in the first trimester, we talk about how common it is. It's not as common uh, to your question, Kate, in the second and third trimesters. Only about two or three percent of pregnancies are lost in the second trimester. Um, and then uh, in the third trimester, stillbirth, which is defined as uh, the loss of a, of a baby after 28 weeks, um, is, is still uh, less, even more so. And, and here's the, the hard part, I think, is that 20 to 60% of those late term stillbirths are unexplained. And I think that's really hard for us to grapple with, right? Uh, when we think about first trimester miscarriages and chromosomal abnormalities, um, we, we can make sense around that. But when we don't have a reason as to why there could have been a loss, that, that in and of itself is really hard. So I think i um, so glad to have Cynthia here to talk about some of the mental health strategies um, around pregnancy loss. So C Cynthia, turning to you, what does mm -hmm. dealing with grief and loss look like right now during COVID-19? Yes, thank you, Kate, and thanks for inviting me to be here today. Uh, this is such an important topic as COVID-19 has instantly changed life as we know it. Um, many are experiencing a new reality marked by grief and loss as weddings, gatherings, school events, medical care, travel have been canceled uh, due to the virus. Not only are there disruptions to the daily flow of our lives, but stressful life events are continuing to unfold despite the presence of the pandemic. Many are caring for elderly family members and children, have loved ones who are dealing with chronic or life-threatening illnesses, have suffered pregnancy loss or cancellation of fertility treatments, as was mentioned, and are struggling with unemployment or financial strain. Any one of these stressors is enough to trigger grief response, let alone managing several. Some of us may also be experiencing what is known as anticipatory grief, which is largely encompasses fear of the unknown or what may lie ahead in the future. Questions such as, when will life return to normal? When can I safely see my family and friends again? Or will I or someone I love become sick with this illness are often played over and over in our minds as we adapt to this new normal. So I would say grief and loss has become much more complex and in many ways distant in the era of COVID-19. Thanks. And, um, you know, uh, moving a little bit also into unemployment, millions of people have lost their job amid the COVID crisis. And so what are strategies for managing grief and loss around your employment? And how can you manage your mental health as you start looking for your next step? Yes, absolutely. And for so many, this unexpected loss, um, you may be triggering to manage feelings of hopelessness, fear, anxiety, financial stressors, loss of your health care coverage. Um, and when you're experiencing this, it's particularly important you allow yourself the opportunity to grieve as career or job is often intimately tied to our identity. Um, when navigating through a period of unemployment, acknowledging the loss and accompanying feelings of shock and sadness is very important um, as it will allow you more mental and emotional space to consider your next steps. Uh, you can do this by, sh by tr um, sharing with a trusted loved one or support network or by accessing support through a mental health professional. Once you settle into that initial period of shock, be sure to start to give your day structure so to feel like you have a sense of purpose and forward momentum in your daily routine. Uh, some may choose to use this period as an opportunity to reevaluate career goals or interests. Uh, reach out to your professional network, establish new connections, 
schedule a session with a Maven job coach or access online professional organizations that may offer guidance and resources during this time. And although it's very easy to do, try to limit the amount of time you spend job searching each day. It's a very daunting task and it's equally important to integrate self-care practices uh, to maintain mental health and wellness. Incorporating exercise or some type of physical activity can reduce cortisol and stress levels. Uh, practicing mindfulness or meditation can help you stay focused on the present rather than spiraling ahead to the anticipatory grief I spoke of a little earlier. Uh, again, reach out to your support network, let them know how you're feeling, try to focus on those things you can control, such as updating your resume or LinkedIn profile. Reevaluate finances or look into state and or federal resources for unemployment benefits. It's also important to remember that the job landscape will likely look very different moving forward, but with these changes will also come new opportunities for employment and growth. Um, so Cynthia, uh, another question to you, um, we're getting a few of these from members of the audience, which is, you know, if mm -hmm. someone's about to lose a close family member or has lost a, a close, you know, member of their, their family or friends, um, and they're not able to say goodbye in person, how, how can someone kind of say goodbye and get closure uh, during this process? Yes, um, that is, it's extremely traumatic and difficult to access that closure. It may be an extended period of grieving, um, but sadly many have lost loved ones during this time or know someone who have, and they were denied the opportunity to say goodbye in person and or grieve together in a public space. These rituals are often very vital in acknowledging the reality of what's happened and in recognizing uh, the memory of, of the person that you cared for. Um, when we can't access this type of closure, it's often we can often experience what's known as ambiguous loss, which is one that's marked by a sense of helplessness and uncertainty. These feelings can delay the bereavement and grief process and often lead to complex and unresolved grief. Um, there are ways you can grieve while maintaining social distance um, that can help facilitate this process. Uh, some have held virtual memorial services or gathered in other ways where groups can engage in the collective experience of mourning. Uh, journaling or writing about your loss is also a good way to process feelings. Um, if you have difficulty tapping into that emotion or kind of stuck in that um, space of shock, uh, I even recommend curating a grief playlist on your favorite streaming platform of songs that might facilitate an emotional response or help you to get in touch with those feelings or provide comforting reminders of your loved one. Uh, partaking in activities that connect us with nature, like planting a tree or a flower garden is another way to memorialize a loss. Um, accessing creative outlets, if you draw or paint or write a letter to your loved one can also be very therapeutic. Let your support network be there for you, but also be direct about what you need. Not every person is equipped to provide support you may be looking for, but remember you're, you're only responsible for your own grief. You don't have to manage anyone else's discomfort. And if you need help beyond a support network or don't have access to your own support network, um, I highly suggest reaching out to online grief support groups, which are readily available right now. Thanks. Uh, so Brian, here's a question for you. I'm a fertility patient and recently underwent an elective abortion at 13 weeks due to a chromosome 21 genetic abnormality. How can I manage anxiety in these difficult times <clears throat> as I begin my next fertility cycle? I'm struggling with the unknown and inability to control what the outcome may be. So I think the first part to recognize is that this individual actually, although the they made the decision to end a pregnancy that had a genetic abnormality, um, they had the opportunity to take control over something that initially was out of their control. And I think it's important for people to recognize that there are a lot of points along the fertility, the fertility journey and, and a lot of times where you can either pivot or pause. Um, and so to recognize that it's not a plug and play situation where you're gonna go into the doctor's office and they're just gonna say, great, we're putting you on autopilot um, and we'll see you in 40 weeks and a baby's gonna fall out. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to stop, to think, to decide, and more importantly, to talk. Um, and I think it's important to have a very honest conversation both with the provider um, and with, if, they're, if this person has a partner, um, with their partner. Right. Quite often, I think people forget about the other individual in the room who wishes 
that they could be the one to take the shots. They wish they could be the one to endure the ultrasounds because they feel terrible watching their their wife or loved one or or partner go through this process. With that said, um, it's important to recognize that this individual will likely have a lot of anxiety until they get to week 14. Um, right? If you've lost a pregnancy of 13 weeks, week 12 is typically pretty terrible um, because you're anticipating the shoe dropping. And when you get past it, um, you start to realize that this is different and that things can be better and things will be better. Um, but I would say to this person is to know that your anxiety and stress can't make you infertile. Running from a lion or a tiger or having a fight or flight type syndrome is not a cause of infertility. Um, it's just an amplifier of the experience. And they should just recognize that they actually have all the control in the situation. And so they should just know that like, if it starts to get a little tough, say it, speak up, because there's a lot of things we can do to help. Um, great. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, so Jane, this one is for you. If someone has had recurring miscarriages or has experienced a miscarriage recently, what are things that they should know um, and can do to not constantly worry about having another miscarriage even after the first trimester? Yeah, um, I think both Brian and I could answer this. So um, pregnancy loss, when it happens um, multiple times, uh, has different etiologies or different reasons depending on uh, which trimester it happened in. So um, Brian actually is an expert in working up patients who have recurrent uh, pregnancy loss in the first trimester, and so maybe I'll let him answer those questions. As to those who might have repeated miscarriages in the second uh, trimester, uh, that's between 14 um, and 28 weeks, Oftentimes, um, they are due to more anatomical reasons. For instance, the cervix um, opens up without um, a woman going into labor called cervical insufficiency, uh, or there could be sources of unknown infection you know, that cause a woman to go into preterm labor and deliver um, a baby uh, before viability. Um, it's really important that uh, if you have a history of, of pregnancy loss in any trimester, that um, you obtain copies of your medical records uh, if you are with a new provider in evaluation of what your increased risks for recurrent pregnancy loss may be. Um, for instance, if your cervix is opening up and, and, and you delivered uh, without going into labor, uh, doctors can put a stitch in the cervix at around 14 weeks to help prevent um, the cervix from doing that. So uh, the more we know about why you've had a miscarriage, uh, the more we can take precautions and potentially uh, fix the problem in subsequent trimester or subsequent pregnancies. But I'll let uh, Brian answer the first trimester question. So quite often we find that patients are um, told that they have a recurrent miscarriage problem and that what they need to do is to have um, vials and vials of blood work taken. And the vials and vials of blood work that are typically done in either a doctor, an OBGYN's office or your internist's office um, are, are really a shotgun approach at one problem, which is um, clotting or blood clotting. Um, so that could be someone having blood that's too thin or blood that's too thick, um, and that be, as a result of these clotting disorders, either genetic, meaning that the person was born with them, or acquired, meaning they've developed antibodies throughout their life that now puts them at increased risk of having blood clots. Um, but I can tell you that the utility of that blood work is actually pretty low. And um, the gross majority of miscarriages, as Jane said before, quite elegantly and correctly, is due to chromosomal abnormalities, which means there is nothing the patient could have done to prevent or cause the miscarriage that occurred. That's why getting the data is so important, right? That's why trying to, you know, collect the process of conception and bring it to your OBGYN's office and get them to run the genetic testing. Or if you have to endure a DNC, which is kind of a evacuation of the contents of the uterus or a scraping of the uterus, make sure they do send it off to a laboratory so you can find out. Um, what I will say, though, is that 
a lot of patients come in anticipating that it's going to be a painful experience to talk about a miscarriage and to work it up. And again, during this COVID-19 pandemic with everything going on, I think we're really seeing the strength and utility of telehealth and telemedicine. And I can tell you that as someone who helps patients through this every day, the best thing to do is to get a good history from your patient and to talk to your patient. And so you don't have to go to a doctor's office. You don't have to go have vials and vials of blood drawn. Um, it can literally start with a really good conversation um, on the Maven app. Thanks, Brian. Um, and so, Cindy, a question for you. Um, and there's two questions around this. So one, I'm feeling tired all the time and I'm not motivated to get out of bed. Um, how do I know if I'm grieving or depressed or something else is going on? And a follow-up to that is, what are some of the signs and symptoms you may be experiencing a grief reaction? Mm -hmm. Sure. So there are many ways our bodies or our minds signal us when something is out of balance. But it is important to note that many of the symptoms um, are normal to experience and expected during a period of crisis. Um, and I definitely believe we're, we're not alone in experiencing them collectively. But when you become increasingly preoccupied with thoughts of loss, lack motivation, uh, are extremely or frequently tearful, experience a depressed or marked change in your mood, uh, physical symptoms such as headache and fatigue, have very difficult sleep, uh, difficulty with sleeping or insomnia or changes in your appetite. These can all be indicators of grief, a grief reaction, and or in some cases depression, which the two can often overlap. But experiencing any of these symptoms, as I mentioned, is expected given the circumstances, but with time they should dissipate as you adjust to the initial crisis. So should you find that they intensify or worsen to the point where you have difficulty functioning or completing daily tasks, or as you mentioned, maybe getting out of bed in the morning, it's important to reach out for support, um, either through a healthcare provider, a therapist, or a trusted loved one as a place to start, but it's most necessary to find a space to process those feelings and explore your treatment options. Um, and finally, last question, Cindy, for you. As a spouse or partner of someone who has suffered a significant job loss, what are ways I can support my partner during this time of loss and grief? Yeah, it can be really challenging because there can be a lot of irritability and anger and sadness. And it's, it's tough um, because there are no magic words to kind of fix the situation. But I think that one of the best things a partner can do is, is remind um, their loved one to take a break from the job searching process, which can at times become all consuming. So, you know, uh, being mindful of caring for those aspects of self um, that will help to maintain uh, health and wellness so you don't get sick on top of this experience as well is very important and instilling a sense of hope so uh, reminding your partner that you're you're in it together you'll get through it together that this is a temporary space and time hopefully we will see some the job market opening up again in the near future um, but I think really striving for some balance is important and also acknowledging those things in which we can't control is important too we often stay very preoccupied on those things that we can't and it creates a sense of overwhelm and anxiety. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. If we didn't get to ask your question or answer your question, you can also download Maven Clinic in the App Store and ask a Maven practitioner for free with the code webinar. Um, and thanks to all of you who have tuned in week to week as we continue to navigate this uncertain time together. This is actually our last Ask Maven Anything. We're going to be transitioning our weekly webinars to weekly Instagram Live. So tune in next week at 12 p.m. at Maven Clinic on Instagram. And a huge, huge thank you to Jane and Brian. Uh, personally, I learn so much from you every week. I, I love, I've loved doing this with you. Thank you so much for all of your clear explanations and all of your compassion for everyone. Um, to everyone listening, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're here for you and stay well.